Happy Halloween, interwebs, and welcome back to Russell's Guide to Monsters. Last time, we looked at leonine chimeral monsters, and I theorized that the manticore is some sort of insect or arachnid. After further consideration, however, I believe its closest real-life equivalent is probably a fish, one which we've mentioned before on this series, and at the end of this episode I'll reveal what it is, because this time we'll be looking at piscine chimeral monsters, that is to say, creatures with fish tails. Have you ever noticed how seemingly every culture has its own local version of a mermaid? Japan has the Ningyo, Zimbabwe has the Mondao and Mamiwata, Suvanamacha is a mermaid of Hindu mythology, Selkies are Scandinavian mermaids, and Maros are mermaids of Irish folklore, just to name a few. I've got a pet theory to explain this cultural congruity, and predictably it all begins with water. You can't have human settlements without it, and where there's water, there's fish. Obviously, people can't live underwater, but they see that fish can and come up with some combination of the two. Give it a little while, and eventually some Westerner will make the connection and call it the local mermaid variant. The same theoretical principle applies to birds and winged humanoids with the power of flight, because wings equal flying ability is a fairly basic logical step. All of this applies to other traditionally land-based animals as well. Basically, slapping wings and fishtails on humans and other terrestrial animals to make supernatural yet recognizable creatures seems to be a nigh-universal human trait, so let's take a look at a few. We've already established that in heraldry, you can make just about any fish-tailed creature you like simply by appending the prefix C to the animal's name, and as a general rule of thumb, if a sea creature's name has a hyphen in it, like sea lion or seahorse, the word C acts as a modifier, so we modify the creature by adding a fishtail. If there's no hyphen and the name is two words, like sea lion, or one, like seahorse, then it's an independent creature. The hyphenated sea lion and seahorse are also known outside of heraldry as the Leocampus and Hippocampus, and the Torocampus is a sea bull. We can find examples in art of winged bulls, winged lions, and winged horses, also known as a Terepus or Pegasus, and if you keep an eye out for it, you can occasionally spot a Hippocampus with wings, which arguably makes it a sea Terepus instead. I've also found multiple examples of winged sea lions in art and architecture, so it should come as no surprise then that examples of the winged Torocampus can be found as well. I was unable to find any image of a winged merlion, however, but this is likely due to the merlion being protected by trademark since the mid-1960s. In addition to a mythical creature, Hippocampus is also the name for a part of the brain and the genus of seahorses, which shouldn't be confused with sea horses or siege horses. That last one is my personal nickname for giraffes, well emblazoned they're known as camel leopards, and although I've found this winged giraffe artwork, I've found no heraldic examples of sea giraffes. Most of the examples I've found from modern artwork, however, depict them using the body of a seahorse, appropriately enough. Sticking with sea ungulates for the moment, we can find sea stags in the armorial bearings of Zerasai, Lithuania, and Marindin, and here we have one being ridden by a Nereid. The Periton is a fictional hybrid of a deer and a bird, and those of you with any skill in pattern recognition can see where this is going. These winged sea caribou are the supporters of the coat of arms of the Federal Court of Canada. Canadian heraldry also gives us non-winged sea caribou in the coat of arms of the Royal St. John's Regatta Committee, and at least two examples of the aforementioned winged sea lion or leo campus. This one is the crest of Canadian serviceman R.J.S. Gibson, and this belongs to the Canadian Department of National Defense's Assistant Deputy Minister. As we've discussed multiple times before, there's a sort of imaginary sliding scale that goes from lion to griffin, and you move from one end to the other by adding an increasing number of aquiline features. To make a true griffin, you give the lion an eagle's head, wings, and taloned forelimbs, and to make a sea griffin, you replace the back half with a fish tail. The issue here is that now there are no lion parts left. It's entirely eagle and fish. For all we know, this is a sea hippogriff. Some have attempted to distinguish it by giving it a lion's paws, but this technically makes it a sea opinicus instead. Winding things back, a hippogriff is the hypothetical offspring of a griffin and a horse, and has the latter's hindquarters, so if we were to crossbreed a griffin with a sea horse or hippocampus, the resultant offspring would theoretically be a sea hippogriff. Furthermore, demigriff is a modern term for wingless griffins such as keythongs and minoan griffins, and since hippocamps are sometimes depicted in art with wings apropos of nothing, a sea hippogriff's plumage could come from either parent or not at all. Do we even need to get a lion involved? Couldn't we just turn a hippocamp into a sea terepus, then keep adding avian features, replacing the horse's head and legs with those of an eagle? Speaking of sea-horse hybrids, let's say a mermaid somehow had a child with a centaur. Mendelian genetics tells us there's an equal likelihood of it being either a merperson or a centaur, but there's also a 1 in 4 chance that it'd just be a relatively normal human. The remaining 25% is the likelihood that it will be a seahorse or hippocampus, but what if some mutation caused it to have human, equine, and piscine features? 
Maybe this is how we get ichthyocentaurs, or maybe it will result in a seahorse-style merperson. If it's a boy, things could get real weird when he's ready to have kids of his own, but it still wouldn't be half as weird as an ichthyocentaur, because biologically speaking, they're completely batshit insane. Your standard ichthyocentaur is a combination of human, horse, and fish, making it a fish-mammal hybrid, like most fictional fish-tailed creatures. Meanwhile, griffins, nagas, and scorpion men combine mammals with birds, reptiles, and arthropods, respectively, but some depictions of ichthyocentaurs combine all of them at once. The basic requirements are the front half of a centaur with the tail of a marine animal, but which animal that is, specifically, is open to interpretation. It could come from a marine mammal, such as cetaceans, sirenians, or pinnipeds, which arguably makes slightly more anatomical sense than a normal centaur. Regular hippocentaurs are six-limbed vertebrates and raise questions like how many sets of organs or rib cages do they have, but a cetacean centaur, centaurian, would be entirely mammalian and possess only four limbs and a tail. More often, though, the ichthyocentaur's tail is that of a fish. Lobe-finned fish, i.e. coelacanths, are more closely related to mammals than ray-finned fish or actinoterygii, and beyond them are sharks and other cartilaginous fishes. In addition to the fishtail, some ichthyocentaurs also have feathered wings like birds, which are basically reptiles, and some have the chelae or claws of crustaceans like crabs, which aren't even vertebrates. This is the primordial sea god Forkis, and here the crab-like appendages replace the horse legs, but Aphros and Bethos are sometimes depicted with the pincers emerging from their heads like horns, such as in this Roman mosaic found in Bularegia. Another mermaid variant is the mermonk, or monkfish. This is, as the name implies, a monk with a fish tail and is basically just a mermaid belonging to a monastery. Despite there being a real-life fish of the same name, the animal most accepted as having inspired this creature is Squatina squatina of the angel shark genus. Another possible source of inspiration is the monk seal. Now, leopard seals are the same thing as sea leopards, but monk seals aren't the same thing as sea monks, sort of like how sea lions aren't sea lions, but a sea lion can be a sea leopard, but not a leopard seal. In addition to the sea monk, there's also a mythical creature called the bishop fish, and this makes me wonder if both the sea monk and bishop fish worship Jesus fish. Sea monks also shouldn't be confused with sea monkeys, which are monkey mermaids and nothing like real sea monkeys. Additionally, just like how the term sea leopard can refer to a leopard seal, the term sea elephant can refer to an elephant seal, but such wasn't always the case. Historically, walruses have also been called sea elephants, because they're both corpulent gray beasts with prominent tusks, and although walruses may seem like an intermediate step between manatees and elephants, they're not. If you're a regular viewer of my other series, How Fascinating, you may recall that elephants are more closely related to manatees than walruses. And, speaking of elephantine taxonomy, this is the elephant shrew, and it's more closely related to the elephant than it is to the shrew. It'd be more accurate to call it a sengi, but let's shift our attention back to sea elephants and manatees, also known as sea cows. Heraldically speaking, a sea elephant would be an elephant with a necessarily huge fishtail, but wouldn't that just make it a scaled-up manatee or dugong? And what do we do about actual manatees, since a heraldic sea cow would simply be a cow with a fishtail? Actually, thinking about it, a cow is just a female bull, and we know that if you give one of those a fishtail, you'll get a toro campus. The ancient Greek word potamos means river, which means that Mesopotamia refers to the land in the midst of rivers, but surprisingly, the Potomac River doesn't mean the river river. Its name actually comes from the Algonquin name Potomac, which possibly means something bought. Anyway, hippopotamus means river horse, but in this 19th century dental advertising, the hippopotamus is referred to as a sea horse. The term sea cow below it probably refers, in this case, to a walrus rather than a manatee or dugong, as the latter don't have tusks. Hippo teeth and walrus ivory, or morse, were common materials for the manufacture of dentures at the time. Blending sea cows and river horses together, Avatar, the last airbender, gave us hippo cows, and in a dream sequence, Fire Lord Ozai even rides a flying, fire-breathing hippo cow. Of course, if you gave a hippopotamus the eagle wings of a griffin, you'd get an entirely different kind of hippogriff. So an elephant seal can be called the sea elephant, although that term also historically referred to walruses, which have also been known as sea cows, and sea cow can refer to manatees and dugongs, which are more closely related to land elephants than sea elephants. Confusing enough for you? Furthermore, manatees were once believed to be mermaids, so if you breed this sea cow with this sea cow, would you get a sea minotaur? What would you even call such a hybrid? A murtar? A minotaurocampus? Maybe we could call this manatee-related minotaur a manatar. This is all getting a bit silly, so perhaps it's time that I return to the topic of manticores which I promised you at the start. Manticores were first discussed all the way back in episode 1, which was originally created just to help differentiate them from chimeras, sphinxes, and griffins. 
To recap, the manticore is a lion with the head of a man, triple rows of teeth, and venomous quills. Then, in the very next episode, we looked at merlions, sea lions, and lionfish, and I now realize that the last one basically is a manticore. The lionfish gets its name by superficially resembling a lion, like the manticore, and it also possesses venomous spines and even multiple rows of teeth. Some depictions of the manticore give it a scorpion stinger instead of quills, but this still works because the lionfish belongs to the family known as scorpionfish. Plus, if manticores did exist, I have no doubt they'd be terrorizing Floridians as well. This raises the question, what would a sea manticore look like? If you replace the back half of the beast with a fish tail, you'd lose the venomous quills, leaving you with a man's face on a sea lion's upper body. Just like how a sea griffin is indistinguishable from a sea hippogriff, this would be nearly identical to a hypothetical sea sphinx. I've seen some depictions of manticores which run the quills all the way up the length of the spine, and some even spread them out into the mane as well, and if we did this, our sea manticore would resemble a lionfish even further. I also used to wonder if the manticore's tail spikes count as a thagomizer, but my girlfriend astutely pointed out that thagomizers are made of bone, whereas manticore quills are, presumably, hardened keratin. If you feel differently, I'd love to know about it in the comments. While we're on the subject of scorpions and fishtails, a scorpion with a fishtail would be referred to in Blazon as a sea scorpion, but it might be hard to tell from a lobster. When someone these days uses the phrase sea scorpions, they're probably referring to an extinct order of arthropods that lived from about 450 to 250 million years ago. They ranged in size from a diminutive eight-tenths of an inch to over eight feet, and although they were members of the Calicerata subphylum, they were not true scorpions, and only the earliest species lived in the sea. It'd be more accurate to call them by their scientific name, Eurypterids, from the Greek meaning broad-winged and referring to their impressive swimming appendages. I sense this turning into an episode of How Fascinating, so I'll call an end here to this video of mermaids and manticores. Hmm. I think mermaids and manticores would be the name of my upcoming pirate-themed D&D campaign if I weren't already going with Dungeons and Dugongs. Anyway, thanks for watching, and have a happy Halloween! It's funny. The very first episode in this series was originally made just to differentiate chimeras, manticores, griffins, and sphinxes from one another, and the next episode examined strange sea beasts. The most recent episode once again focused on chimeras, manticores, griffins, and sphinxes, and now this one looked at sea beasts again. I guess that means the next episode will be more things with wings. Get hype!